So, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Gilberto Pastorello. I'm going to be doing some tech support today. And um, from um, Michigan State University, uh, here's your host, uh, Gabriela. Sure, please <laughs> take it away. Yeah, hey, uh, hello and welcome everyone. So this is the first of many upcoming webinars that are going to be hosted by FluxNet and Ameriflux. This session is going to be recorded and available online for anybody interested in revisiting it or sharing it with others. I also learned that we are doing a YouTube live session as well, so that's pretty exciting. Um, our overall goal is to make the best of our new virtual reality. We're going to be connecting scholars from all around the globe um, because many of our FluxNet members are uh, located in multiple regions. So today the schedule is gonna look like this. We have our guest speaker who's gonna present for 45 minutes. Then we'll have 15 minutes of Q&A. So you'll see that there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen if you wanna submit questions there. Um, I recommend waiting until the end of like the 45 minutes uh, to get the attention. Uh, then our panelists will collect these Q&A and pass them to me where I'll announce them to uh, Dr. Baldoki. So introducing uh, Dennis Baldoki, he is a professor of biometeorology at the University of California, Berkeley. He's gonna speak about the history of the eddy covariance flux measurements, its changing theory, methods and applications, and the eventual establishment of FluxNet. So Professor Baldoki helped pioneer the eddy covariance method and his research approach involves the coordinated use of long-term quasi-continuous flux measurements and the theoretical models to study biosphere atmospheric interactions. Today, he's a co-investigator of the Ameriflux Management Project, helping support the Ameriflux and FluxNet networks. Welcome, Professor Baldoki. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for this uh, opportunity to chat with you all. Uh, I know we've all been home for a long time, so it's nice to have some seminars again. And typically this time of year, we'd be giving uh, short courses at a uh, flux course in Colorado, for example. Um, today's talk, let's see, oh, let's see this again. come on, yeah, today's talk, We'll give you some background and history of um, fluxes per se. Um, I'd like to also give you a little bit of a personal history because I think it's interesting for all of us to kind of get the sense of how we get to where we are and we all follow different paths. Uh, I'd like to show you some of the history of the sensors and computers and data storage to allow what we are able to do today. And then uh, I was asked to kind of talk about some of the scientific questions and priorities that you all are facing because many of you are more data users than data producers, and what can we do to make the most out of our, our data? Um, my background started out as a farm kid in California. I grew up in an Ammon Walnut Ranch, and I was interested in weather, so I went to UC Davis and studied atmospheric sciences there. Uh, the good thing about Davis is it was an ag school, and they had us as atmospheric science majors take botany and biology, which was really critical. And I took some really foundational courses on uh, plant water relations from Ted Shaw and ag ecology from Bob Loomis. But also my professor was Jerry Hatfield who actually taught a biometeorology course. And I got to do an internship with him and measure leaf area index on this famous uh, lysimeter here at Davis. And this is where I got introduced to fluxes and learned that it's really, really important to measure fluxes. Um, Bill Pruitt was really the giant of studying ET and he taught a graduate course and he let me in. So I got to see that from firsthand. And then when I graduated, my aunt um, worked at Davis and she asked Jerry, what present should she get me for graduation? And he says, vegetation in the atmosphere from Monteith. And that really opened my eyes to all the wonderful things we're doing today. The next step was um, graduate school. And at Davis, we also studied Norm Rosenberg's book, um, Microclimates. And I was able to get a fellowship there. And it was really, again, a good opportunity because because this is one of the few groups measuring fluxes at the time. Um, they were using gradients and it was really hard. <laughs> um, our sensors were really rudimentary. Uh, we had a lot of kinks in our profiles. Uh, just, it was a mess. And we tried to take long-term seasonal measurements, but it, it, it was hard. Um, the biggest thing we started to find as the theory started evolving was that gradient methods don't work so well, especially over rough uh, canopies. Um, after Nebraska, I went to Oak Ridge, Tennessee and NOAA uh, for a postdoc and I worked with Boyd Hutchinson and Bruce Hicks and they organized one of the first workshops on forest atmosphere interactions. And this was a really pivotal uh, workshop. Um, and one of the people at the workshop was Tom Denby. And Tom was showing some of the first data 
uh, that had eddy flux and gradient measurements. And they were finding what was called counter gradient transport because of large shear at the interface. So no wonder my uh, fluxes weren't working so well at Nebraska. Uh, the other thing was it gave me a chance to meet a lot of people and learn um, a lot about what was going on with the history. Paul Jarvis was at this meeting also, and he was one of the leaders. And he essentially told me, you know, the findings at the Thetford Forest really led to a short-term demise of forest meteorology until eddy covariance could be applied because of these strong uh, mixing, weak gradients, and counter gradient transport. And Mike Robpock, John Stewart, Alistair Tom were some of the people that had been working on that. A theme you'll see throughout this talk is one called serendipity <laughs> and embracing serendipity. Um, I was lucky when I was at Nebraska that Shashi Verma was my uh, PhD advisor and he was starting to do work with the eddy covariance method uh, with Dean Anderson, my, my, my classmate. But also when I went to Oak Ridge, Bruce Hicks was our director and Bruce was really one of the pioneers. Uh, Bruce was trained in Australia and worked with Bill Swinbank and Arch Dyer. And so Bruce had the history, the knowledge to really start putting things together essentially. The other key feature of being at Oak Ridge was my other postdoc mentor, Boyd Hutchinson. Uh, Boyd was a, a forest ecologist, forest meteorologist, and he established really one of the few and only tall towers in the world at the time. And so we were starting to use that as our uh, perch to start making measurements of fluxes above force. Um, and one of the difficulties at the early time was just anemometry. Uh, uh, anemometry was quite crude. Uh, Shashi, for example, had to use these home-built two-dimensional drag anemometers that John Norman had developed, essentially. Uh, Campbell was developing a one-dimensional sonic anemometer, but as I'll show you in a few moments, the world's not flat. And so there's a lot of problems with this. I think it also had issues with wetness. Um, some people use what call 3D me three-dimensional propeller anemometers, but they had inertial problems. It takes a certain amount of wind to get the propeller to move and, and change. Luckily, uh, NOAA was a national lab and we had money and Bruce bought I think, three sonic anemometers, three-dimensional sonic anemometers that were just being commercialized. And they're about $20,000 each. And this is, you know, $1980. So think about this in today's world. Um, the first measurements we were trying to do in 83 were just simply measuring water fluxes. Uh, the technology then was to use what was called a Lyman Alpha hygrometer. Um, the problem with it was it wasn't waterproof. My wife still gives me trouble about this. And so we had to be out in the field every moment that you're taking a measurement, especially in Tennessee where we got lots of thunderstorms in the afternoon because water would get on the window, which was magnesium fluoride, and would etch it and destroy the sensor. So we were always nervous, trying to catch an extra minute or two to keep the run going before the thunderstorm would come. Tilden Myers and I would run up and down towers and not get electrocuted. Um, so this is part of the trials and tribulations. At, at that Oak Ridge meeting, Shashi came, and we kind of hatched out a chance to start measuring CO2 fluxes. Um, at the time, there were five open path CO2 sensors in the world. Uh, Shashi had one, and Bruce Hicks and Marv Wesley had another. Uh, Ray Desjardins in Canada and Otaki in Japan had built their own, and Gail Bingham, who had developed the uh, DOE sensors, had one uh, just spare at Livermore, essentially. So in the summer of 84, we organized a, a um, bootleg campaign, and this is two of the sensors we had um, on our tower. I found some old, old images here. Um, it was an exciting time. Um, there wasn't much going on back then, so in three weeks of work, we got four papers. And so that was kind of exciting for us all. And these were all some of the first eddy flux measurements over force. And we also tried to measure fluxes above and below the force so we could start thinking about attribution of net carbon exchange due to photosynthesis in soil. And so this is all going back to the, the early 80s. Uh, I guess to give you all young scientists perspective today, you can't publish four papers in three weeks of data. Uh, our most recent paper with uh, Kyle uh, is uh, 36 site years with 10 sites in one paper. So this is the importance of FlexNet and Ameriflux and sharing data so we can you know, do more novel, bigger and better things, a uh, little perspective, I guess. 
Um, also being at Oak Ridge, we had a really good set of uh, technicians, engineers, and David Obel was an engineer that worked with Tilden Myers and with Bruce Hicks. And by the late 80s, early 90s, they from scratch built a whole brand new uh, infrared gas analyzer open path. And to me, this really was a game changer because now this allowed us to start making long term eddy flux measurements. Um, we fabricated about 20 of them and they went to groups like Walto Shells and um, San Diego. Uh, I think Dave Hollinger bought one, uh, a few other people. So this really led to ultimately Lycor developing and commercializing their open top sensor that we use to this day, essentially. Um, some of the early um, FlexNet work was done with a closed path sensor, but there's definitely preferences under certain conditions to have an open path uh, CO2 sensor. Now, that's just the hardware. Uh, we still have to acquire data, and that alone was, was quite a feat we had to face. Uh, Shashi had developed in Nebraska this data general mini computer here that had to be programmed in assembler. Uh, the magnetic tapes held only three hours of data. So every moment you're out there, you're changing tapes. You're, it's just impossible to do long-term flux work. By the time I got to Oak Ridge, uh, there started to be these little laptop computers. Bruce bought one of these first Osbournes, for example, and we did some of our early work with that. Some of the things that we also had to consider was uh, analog to digital conversion. And so yeah, one had the right code to take the bytes coming from the sensors and shifting bytes and storing them as two byte integers. Uh, luckily, again, being a national lab, we had a great team, Bob McMillan, uh, was a colleague and he was really good at writing code and he wrote some of the first um, basic versions of our uh, data software again that a lot of the early ameriflux teams used bev law dave hollinger walter shell uh, then later tilden myers was able to convert all this to c and which is also what i used uh, early in my career um, our earlier computers had storage problems uh, we could only store 128 kilobytes on a floppy disk so it was impossible to store raw 10 hertz data. Uh, Bruce had come from the idea of what was called a Fluxotron. It was an analog computer that he had developed in the 60s with Arch Dyer. And so the idea was to use what was called a recursive filter. So Bruce convinced us to use what was called a digital recursive filter to do real time flux covariance calculations. A lot of our early work was what was the optimal time constant for these filters. And so these are questions we don't even ask anymore because we, we don't need to do them uh, because <laughs> we can store data. Um, my evolution has gone from 128K to 44 megabytes, I think during some of the early boreas years and now my tech Joe bought me a two terabyte disk. <laughs> so it's incredible um, how much data that we can store now. Other issues we had to face in the early days and even today is that interesting questions aren't flat, flat pancake fields in Kansas. We want to study ecosystems, real world. And so that means there's some incline, uh, there's some slopes. And this is one of the reasons we've started using three dimensional sonic anemometers at the very, very beginning. So how do you do coordinate rotations? Uh, well, the theories were actually, again, uh, by colleagues, Champ Tanner at Wisconsin with his former students, Marv Wesley and George Sertel had written these army reports. So again, it was a small community and we were sharing mimeograph documents to get a sense of uh, the theory and the applications. I mean, now this is probably first order cut and dried. You could derive knowing some trigonometry, but uh, at the time we were more interested in trying to get stuff going. So it was nice to share ideas and papers. And so these are some of the early attempts to think about coordinate rotations and make us think about how to design our, our experiments, essentially. The other thing we had to run into is um, mixing ratio versus molar density. Um, the covariance is very simple if you're able to measure the mixing ratio, but CO2 sensors measure mole density. They measure the amount of moles in a volume. And that volume can change with fluctuations of temperature or fluctuations of moisture, essentially. And the idea is that you have a volume of air. And if there is some change in that volume because of temperature and um, humidity, it's going to cause a, a virtual velocity, essentially. And this is why 
you know, we had to actually apply this equation here and solve for infinitesimally small vertical velocity that occurs from this. And this is really the background of the Webb Pyramid Looney equations that we all apply. Um, this theory, and it's not a correction, it's, it's the real physics. And the idea is to understand theory to help design experiments. So if one's measuring CO2 flux, to do it right, we also have to measure water flux and we have to measure heat flux. And so this is really part of the background and reason why the things we measure through FluxNet and the Meriflux are being measured essentially. And it really led to profound findings. I mean, if we only measured the flux density of CO2, we'd be measuring photosynthesis over dead grass. And we know that's not true. Um, in fact, once we apply these, we start seeing actually really small losses of carbon essentially. And again, this has led to another case of serendipity. Uh, and I guess in the uh, mid 2000s, Louis Shepard was on sabbatical at Davis and he came by to visit me and showed me some of his data with uh, uh, Rutledge, his student. And they were finding this in New Zealand and I was showing him this results here and we were shocked. <laughs> but the whole point is that you can discover new things, another sense of, of serendipity. So this brings us to, to, to today, essentially, where you all are. This is the FluxNet network, and it's amazing how many dots there are all across the world, essentially. And there's many, many dots that need to be added. We're still, I think, under sample in, in Africa, in Siberia. We still need more sites across Latin America. So I, hopefully I can encourage young scientists as they become more permanent to you know, add to this and get a better sense of the world about us. Now, Part of the reason this network has been successful is really getting back to human contact and human interaction. Um, a lot of the early workshops were really transformative and got people to know each other and trust each other. Uh, Ricardo Valentini and I organized the first FlexNet workshop in 95 in Latouille, Italy, a ski resort. And we worked really hard, but we also skied. <laughs> and of course, being in Europe, our colleagues like to show off their best uh, products. And so the French bought the wines, the Scotch bought the Scotch, and the Italians had the pasta. And of course, we had other workshops over the time. And you know, Timo Vessels had many, many workshops in Finland. And so we've had a lot of chances to interact and share ideas in the sauna. And so I cannot forget the saunas. <laughs> So we have data, we're starting to share data, but now what do we do with this data? And Tim Crawford, my, my colleague at Oak Ridge always warned me when I first was writing proposals to FluxNet, he says, watch out Dennis, data will come at you like a fire hose. Uh, and he was true. Um, if you look at this timeline of history, you know, when we first worked it in the early eighties, we had 30 hours of data. Um, Steve Vossi was really the first to actually put up a sensor for a whole year and get a year's worth of data, which uh, encouraged Andy Black, Ricardo and me to start our long-term measurements. And so by the time we had this Marconi workshop, which is the t-shirt I'm wearing, uh, 20 years, almost uh, a week ago, you know, we had hundred years of data. Uh, at that time, we could get by with just sharing Excel spreadsheets. Uh, my postdoc, uh, former postdoc, Ava uh, Falga, was really instrumental of organizing that data and processing the data. But you really couldn't keep doing that. And so it really brought to bringing in some professionalization with other colleagues to come up with the next Latwil data set with a thousand site years and even now. And so it leads to another set of serendipity. Um, being at Berkeley one day, Catherine Van Engen from Microsoft and Deb Agarwal knocked on my door and says, we're interested in helping you out with data. They'd worked with physicists and they like environmental scientists and they liked environmental problems. And it was fantastic. And then also Ricardo Valentini had a student named Dario Papali who you may have heard of. And Dario also spent several, um, times in our lab and he actually created a GlobeNet data set back in the early 2000s and was trying to pull together a much larger data set, which really is starting to be the foundation of what you see today through Ameriflex, ICOS and, and FluxNet. So it's good to measure fluxes, but we, we're scientists. You know, we don't just wanna measure fluxes per se. And, and I think that was one of my gripes as a early scientist. I'd see colleagues just go out there and measure fluxes. And they weren't asking questions. And so it's always important to measure things like leaf area index, uh, soil respiration, 
uh, physiological capacity of the leaves, you know, ACI curves, VC max, leaf nitrogen. We really want to understand how and why fluxes vary at different times, at different locations, at different seasons. And so the idea is that this net ecosystem flux we measure from a tower is this difference between photosynthesis and respiration of the ecosystem. The problem is we have one equation and two unknowns. So how do we get around that? Well, I mentioned earlier in my, our first study with Shashi and throughout the rest of my career, I've always tried to have a dual flux system. Uh, it's not perfect, but we found we can actually apply an eddy covariant system in the stem space of actually fairly open canopies, essentially. And it's led to some pretty interesting results that give us some independent measurements of net ecosystem production versus gross production, essentially. Now, I realize everyone can't do this. And so from the early days with Ava, we tried to do a workaround. And the idea was to try to take nighttime measurements as respiration and extrapolate them over the day period to get some sense what daytime respiration is, take the difference, and then compute photosynthesis. And this is a lot of the basis of a lot of the flux partitioning that we see even today in the, the FlexNet workshops. So the first question was how to do that extrapolation. So we'd take a lot of nighttime measurements and try to fit these curves with, with temperature. Yeah. And it kind of worked, but one thing that bothered me is if you looked at a lot of the early literature is they, they'd have Q10 values of six and seven that were just not biological. And they were based on the idea that people got a wide enough range of temperature by making the measurements across the whole growing season. Well, there's a problem there because there's a lot of other biological problems and processes occurring over the growing season. And I remember at Davis as an atmospheric scientist taking biology, we learned about enzyme kinetics and respiration rates of enzyme kinetics have a Q10 of about two. So that always bothered me that we shouldn't use these high Q10s, especially if they're misused in climate modeling because they're uh, force people to compute numbers of respiration that are much higher than they really are. And so with Lu Kang Zhu, my former postdoc, we started breaking up our data sets into seasonal variation. And especially here in California, we go from very wet to very dry conditions. And if we do this, we seem to get steady Q10s just at our reference rate uh, change. And this really is kind of the basis of Marcus Reichstein's uh, famous paper that's widely used now, is that the idea is that you have these running um, values of a baseline respiration uh, that you can use to calculate the temperature dependence that we use for the flux partition. Now there's another issue though, at night, it gets very calm. And so if it's too calm, you don't get enough mixing. The CO2 builds up in the airspace, it doesn't pass your sensors. And so uh, Dario and Liang Hong Gu both had done a lot of pioneering work on trying to understand these threshold values of where we can accept and reject data. And again, this is all part of the processing programs that you take for granted right now and when we see our calculations of annual fluxes. Um, I've also been taught about multiple constraints. Um, look at things from different viewpoints. So another thing we did with Ava was think about respiration from daytime data. So if we take a light response curve, so this is solar radiation, this is our CO2 flux, and extrapolate those fluxes at zero light, what's that respiration rate? And then try to do that as a uh, function of temperature. And so this is just a simple example of what I've been doing from our alfalfa site. It's very windy during most of the day. We get some nice intercepts, and then we can kind of calculate these with, with temperature. So this is an alternative approach. And the good thing is it's not so bad. Uh, this is annual sums and Ava compared the uh, light response respiration rates with the uh, nighttime flux here. And you can kind of see the one-to-one -one slope, uh, about 0.98. Um, for our, our virus site, um, good correspondence, but there's a slight um, slope off of one here essentially. So what else can we do? Well, there's another approach. Dave Bowling um, pioneered this idea of using stable isotopes because now we have two equations and two unknowns. Let's measure the fluxes of del 13 co 2 And so he has this isoflux. So now if we measure our regular CO2 flux and the isoflux, we can now solve for a respiration in photosynthesis. 
And this is an example of what we did with um, Patty Okawa um, working with LGR. They had an isotope machine uh, that they collaborated with us. And you can compare the famous Reichstein approach here that kind of shows high respiration during the day with the isotope flux. It's about 10% difference here, essentially. So this really leads to what was, I consider one person's signal, another person's noise. And Trevor Keenan has recently been looking more and more at these daytime respirations and finding, going back to the Coke effect is that there is inhibition of respiration in the presence of light. And so he's able to then revisit a lot of the flux data and get some sense of what this degree of, of inhibition is essentially. So just to kind of recap, um, where I go for what we thought in the early days with multiple constraints was a reasonable uh, assumption leads to interesting new scientific processes that now we can look at across the network and come up with some sense of how widespread this is essentially. So this is with the beauty of actually working together, sharing data and knowing processes and knowing the science about where to go. So where are we now? Well, our big question now is trying to assess fluxes everywhere all the time. We really wanna provide data that really help us understand such things as what is global annual gross primary productivity. Um, most of the estimates you see are really inferred. They're based on models. They're based on remote sensing. You know, how can the flux community contribute to a, another multiple constraint? So this really leads to the final part of, of this uh, of talk here where um, we wanna think more about handshaking between uh, eddy fluxes and, and, and remote sensing. What can we do? What's, what's happening right now? Well, <laughs> the first thing is just Google Earth. Uh, it, it's astounding to be able to look at our field sites now. Uh, when I set this site up 20 years ago, the only way I could find a site was just drive through the countryside. And we had a, hell of a time trying to find a, a, a flex tower site. Uh, finally, one weekend, we went driving through the foothills of Ione and found some nice uh, lands. And Mr. Tonzi happened to be getting out and getting his mail. Again, serendipity. And I had Nancy Kang, my student with me, and he was an old uh, widower, kind of lonesome. And we got out and introduced ourselves. And he was curious and welcomed us to his ranch. And it was this beautiful savanna system, essentially. And we've been making missions there for 20 years now. Um, if I look at uh, oak savannas across California, this is about the only one that's this extensive with fetch, with a nice mix of trees and, and fairly flat. Most of our oak savannas in California are really on our hilly terrain, essentially. And remote sensing and Google's also helped us a lot understanding our new work on, on wetlands, essentially. And there is a lot more of a challenge. Uh, you see um, extended uh, vegetation, but there's a lot of water mix. And so we really need to think more about what is in our fetch. And so this really leads us to revisiting stuff that Monique Leclerc did back in the, the early 80s is really thinking about flux footprints. Um, before Monique's work, um, we kind of followed Monteith's idea of 101 fetch to height ratio. And we would quibble and argue there was a tree in Nebraska that was, I don't know, 500 meters upwind. And we were worried whether that tree was affecting our fluxes. And Norm was even thinking of taking a chainsaw and cutting down the tree. Um, but the reality is that these flux footprint models are, are critical to really interpret what we're doing now. And over the years, various teams have developed two-dimensional footprints that will vary with um, atmospheric stability. Uh, this is one with Matteo Detto, uh, Shea, and Gabby Cotille's uh, group uh, that developed, that, that we use a lot in our, in our lab here. And you can kind of see the distribution of where the flux is uh, peaking and uh, how far it extends up, up, up wind, essentially. Well, flux footprints, I think, are really important to link with remote sensing at high resolution and information we're trying to invert from our flux towers. Uh, one of the things the flux towers can do nicely are just things like phenology and, and length of growing season. When does photosynthesis turn on? When does it turn off? Um, we're collaborating with Irina Dronova. And so she's using this high resolution um, remote sensing over our wetlands and she can then calculate the duration of the growing seasons and then relate that to what we see for our flux towers. And then she can compare with rabbit eye and Landsat and other indices 
So it's really, again, important to have kind of this, this, this handshaking. Um, simultaneously, um, Andrew Richardson and his group has developed the PhenoCam network. And again, this is a really key contributor to interpreting our flexes. We can see how green the vegetation is. Is it physiologically stressed? Are the leaves present, but, but have they gone dormant? Uh, what is the length of the growing season? And with his um, former postdoc, um, Toomey, um, we were able to compare uh, across the, the network um, things like this greenness index from our uh, cameras with um, GPP, for example. And so to me, this is important because now we can actually maybe do some applied work with um, carbon markets, for example. You know, Eduflux systems are expensive, but can we put digital cameras over um, carbon sequestration projects and infer photosynthesis based on cheap digital cameras? And if we know about links between respiration and photosynthesis, we can actually calculate net carbon exchange for, for you know, hundreds of dollars instead of um, tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So these are, again, the opportunities, I think, for the next generation of flex net scientists to, to think about and, and, and apply. Um, there's also a lot of new hyperspectral um, information. And from that, one can derive information on canopy scale traits, leaf nitrogen, uh, et cetera. Um, Anchor Design, his group, Sean uh, Dubois, has, has done some work with that. And this is just kind of a quick cutout of some of the hyperspectral indices that they were correlating with uh, our photosynthesis from a whole range of sites. I think one of the new game changers is this work coming out of Joe Berry's lab with Grayson Bagley. Um, many of us may have kind of followed this old paradigm of light use efficiency models. We're trying to get photosynthesis from space, uh, we measure reflected light, we measure NDVI, we try to estimate a fraction of an absorbed PAR and maybe tweak our flux data for some light use efficiency model. It takes a lot of tuning and this is really the basis of the GPP product of MODIS. Well, many, many, many years ago, Pierce Sellers had this idea that reflected near infrared vegetation vegetation relates well with uh, absorbed PAR essentially. And it kind of teases out the green and dead vegetation. So uh, Grayson and Joe tested this idea um, with a few flux tower sites using uh, satellite retrievals. And it's been kind of a highly cited paper that has been very, very interesting. So at our sites, we've been measuring um, hyperspectral reflectance with very simple homemade light emitting diode sensors back since 2007 or so. And in the recent years, uh, several companies have commercialized these. So we're able to actually measure um, reflected light in the red and the near infrared and calculate near infrared vegetation light. And this is our most recent um, data. And I'm really excited about this approach. I, I think this is a, a nice way to better upscale um, photosynthesis from space. Uh, this is our Tule wetlands. And what was cool here is the two different years differed in photosynthetic capacity because this year the system was flooded and they drained the wetland to some degree this year. And so it had much lower photosynthesis. And remember this system has a lot of dead vegetation. So if you're using traditional light use efficiency models, it just doesn't work. And then alfalfa is a great example because it's changing leaf area up and down as we go through multiple cuttings here in California. Uh, this site gets cut five, six times a year. And so this near infrared from vegetation really tracked the changes in photosynthesis we're seeing. So I, I think this is really exciting. And then of course, getting to fluxes everywhere and all the time. Um, Martin Young and Marcus Reichstein in Germany and uh, Jingfeng Zhao in uh, the US and New Hampshire have really pioneered this idea of taking machine learning models, uh, regression tree models, uh, and then trying to upscale uh, flux. In fact, also Dario Papali, I think from his dissertation, did it for Europe essentially also. And so we can see a lot of interesting uh, processes that occur. And so this is a way to really coming up with maps of, of fluxes based on tower data. Now I'll wind down finally with other trace gases. Um, Often in Meriflux and FlexNet, we focus on 
CO2. Uh, I stress we should also look a lot more at water. Water tends to be ignored and also other things like momentum transfer and, and heat exchange essentially. But trace gases have a long history starting really with just chambers. Uh, and chambers have um, problems. Uh, they have a limited area that they can sample. In the past, they had to be done manually. Um, people may not be out in the field when there's episodic pulses essentially. And this is another issue of serendipity. Uh, in the early 2000s, Doug Baer was a, a developer of uh, spectroscopy out of Stanford. I uh, developed a company in Los Gatos and came knocking on our door at Berkeley. And he had this new um, tunable dial laser spectrometer to measure methane. Uh, and so we were able to get some funding to, to buy one of the early sensors, essentially. Um, the problem was it needed a huge pump. It needed power. And so we were really limited to where we could uh, deploy it. Uh, this is our peatland. We had hoped it'd be flooded and be a nice source, but it was mostly full of pepperweed and ticks. Uh, so it wasn't the best. But uh, wait, patience. <laughs> uh, LICOR ended up developing their open path sensor. And what's nice about this is it would run off solar panels. It didn't need power. So you could actually put the sensor where the fluxes are. But look at this thing, boy, it's big. And so we had a lot of questions. You know, this was $40,000. I didn't really want to go out and buy a sensor for $40,000 that may not work well. So luckily, Lu Kongju, uh, my former postdoc, was working with LICOR. And so we were able to have him come out and do some intercomparisons with uh, Matteo Detto. And lo and behold, we're looking at the spectra here, co-spectra, and it responds pretty well with the proper spectral corrections. So it really gave me confidence that we could start using this uh, open path uh, methane sensor. And so now we're deploying it in the wetlands here and just learning a lot. It's a lot of fun work, again, to do other trace gases. Um, the nice thing we're learning, <laughs> there's no free lunch, I guess, in terms of trying to solve climate problems. Um, these Thule wetlands can grow to be three meters tall. They have a really long growing season. Uh, they're flooded, so that flooding turns off respiration, so they can be really big sinks of carbon. Uh, since the last ice age, they built up 10, 20, 30 meters of peat. So these are really um, strong carbon sinks, but the flooding causes methane to be produced. And this is again why it's important to really compare other trace gases and not just look at one flux alone. So again, know the science, get the sensors and, and design the experiments. And so now we have, I think, eight systems. We have many, many years of methane fluxes and just having a lot of fun uh, doing this and contributing a lot to the next flux net synthesis, which is a methane flux net synthesis here, essentially. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep on time. I kind of probably went faster than I should, but um, I think it's good to have discussions and um, uh, conversation. So I just want to conclude here. Um, I think I've hopefully shown you that technically we've come a long ways. Uh, there were a lot of trials and tribulations, blood, sweat, and tears literally in the, the early days. Um, the sensors really were noisy. They drifted. We had to calibrate often uh, in the early days, every few hours, if not uh, a few times a week. Uh, we had to be limited to line power, and our sensors weren't weatherproof. So we really essentially had to be out there every hour, of every day that we were collecting data. And our computer systems had little storage in our memory. Um, conversely, today, I'm taking flux measurements at what, 11 flux towers sitting here yakking to you, essentially. Um, we have digital systems, low noise, stable calibrations, they're weatherproof, uh, they can operate offline, so we can actually ask ecosystem scale questions on ecosystem time scales at interesting ecosystems. And as the prices have come down, we can have multiple towers to ask questions about management, um, functional structural variations, even within our own meso networks, let alone the whole flux network essentially. So for you all, I mean, today's challenge is really get back to data mining and data science essentially. You know, how do we organize these data? How do we discover these data? Um, how do we interpret these data and know the physics, the biology, the ecology? Uh, and then how would we upscale in time and space um, with remote sensing? 
Um, I've had fun as a scientist working with great students and postdocs and technicians. Uh, it's really been very uh, fun and rewarding. And um, I've had the privilege, I guess, as a professor to be patient, <laughs> even though I'm an impatient person, to kind of wait for the right data, the right time to do the right paper. Uh, definitely had the opportunity to embrace serendipity, which is, I think, kind of the, the fun parts. Um, rain pulses, um, phenology, um, methane, all these are all bits and pieces of it, essentially. And I also realize it takes a village. We all can't do this alone. And so it's really important to interact and share, which is why I think this talk is so important, why FluxNet and Ameriflux and ICOS are so important and OzFlux. And so really we wanna foster collegiality and collaboration. We wanna share data. Um, and again, comes through trust and interaction and that comes with great food, wine, and having interesting locales to really get to know each other and build bonds. And I'm about two minutes early, so I, I think I'll stop here and I'm lucky to chat with you all and um, thank you for your, your, your um, interest. Uh, Gabrielle? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation and I certainly learned a lot about how FluxNet was created and about your own journey through academia and um, I know that I'll be keeping the message of embracing serendipity as I move forward as well. Um, I also really appreciated the, uh, the shout outs to all of the authors and collaborative projects that are going on within the FluxNet network. That was going to be one of my personal questions, which is uh, where, are we, where are we at now as a group of scientists and how can we start engaging? Um, but before we start uh, jumping into Q&A, I want to let everybody know that Gilberto will be giving a poll. Uh, so in the poll is some demographic information, and we would really appreciate if you could fill that out for us so we can get a feel of the room, or uh, many rooms in this case. Um, so who are we talking to? And then secondly, uh, I do have one of our first questions for you, Dennis, which is um, apparently you have a Marconi shirt. Uh-huh. Yeah. Can you show that to us? Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, there it is. It looks good. Let's see, I All right. There we go. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, another question that we had come in uh, from Maggie. Interesting presentation. Thanks. What are, in your opinion, the top three lessons you have learned in your career when it comes to data and metadata management for flux measurements? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, just be organized. I mean, I'm really lucky. My technician, Joe Verfali, has really developed a really great data system for us now in our lab. Um, in the old days, I mean, we tried to keep good notes, but they were on pieces of paper or later on little word documents and they were kind of all over the place. And Joe's created this wonderful data system now that we log where every sensor is. When we go to the field, we actually submit our notes so all of our team can read it. We log our calibrations. We know our sensor history, sensor history calibration. Uh, I guess in the old days, you know, we did things for two or three weeks. And so you didn't invest all the hard, hard work it takes to create a good data management system. But, you know, since we're doing this for 20 years, it's really paid off. Um, you know, I'm writing a paper right now on 20 years of, of ET data. And I wanted to just download our uh, phenology data. And I just went to Joe's thing, pushed a couple buttons and pff, the data were in my fingertips. You know, years ago I would have had to run down the hall and get a stick and go find it and on some drive, who knows where it is. And so, so it's really, again, data discovery. And, and then again, this gets back to the lessons we also learned from uh, Deb Agarwal and, and Catherine Van Yen. Again, also, you know, they tried to, um, provide adult supervision on, on good data practices. And, and that's so, again, we take for granted um, the labeling of all the variable names, uh, the units that we adopt and use. And this is all part of it so we can um, exchange information. So is that good enough? That's a fantastic answer. Um, I do wanna say uh, to everybody that is asking a question, we can unmute you. So if you would like to personally ask that question. Um, so go ahead and raise your hand. We have Gabriel looking at the chat. I'm going to go ahead and read the next question though um, while people are doing that. So from Gavin, we have, thank you for the great talk. I have one question on the theme of new trace gases. What are the prospects for EC measurement of nitric oxide as well as other gases such as ammonia? Ah, yeah, those are ones I kind of stay away from. Uh, the, the problem with nitrous oxide is it's very uh, intermittent. 
and the sensors are $100,000 because you need mid IR lasers to run them. And so in some respects, I think you're getting just as good measurements, if not better with um, chambers. And remember, as we go to these gases that have smaller and smaller concentrations and it's an open path sensor, you still have to do these density corrections. And so little errors in sensible and latent heat can really cause large errors in the flux that you calculate for these other gases. Uh, ammonia is even worse. It's extremely sticky. Uh, anyone who's tried to use a closed path sensor has terrible problems. Uh, there's a group now trying to have an open path meth or ammonia sensor. Okay, so that avoids the stickiness of problem, but then you get back to these density effects. And again, it's very intermittent. Um, did a cow poop or pee up when? Uh, did the team fertilize or not? And so you're going to spend a lot of time not seeing much. And then you'll see a lot. And then you may have bad sensors that you miss it. <laughs> so um, I'm sticking with methane and CO2 and water personally. <laughs> so a good question. Okay, great. Uh, next question would be from Jess. Thanks for the presentation, Dennis. Looking at the map of eddy covariance sites around the world, there is data from every continent and every biome. Do you see a benefit to increasing the amount of flux sites throughout the globe to collect more data? Or is it possible to infer everything we need to know about the Earth's climate from the sites that already exist or have recorded data in the past? Hmm. Well, I mean, there's still limitations of data, I think, in upper Siberia, a lot of the Andes, uh, India, I mean, there's nothing there hardly. And we know right now, I mean, God, they're facing 40, 45 degrees Celsius. You know, how do these ecosystems responding to these huge changes in temperature? So I think there's still um, need to have more sites in different parts of the world. Um, the Congo, <laughs> you know, Central Africa. I've, I've learned from Caillou Gaon's papers that the tropics aren't the tropics everywhere. Uh, um, Brazil has different sets of climate that drives it than Africa, than flat, and then um, Indonesia. And so we just can't, I think, oversimplify uh, some of these um, places that have been under undersampled. And again, I'd like to think, you know, we're the canary in the mine. We have the background data and the world is changing really fast. Uh, if you've read the paper, it's 100 degrees F, what, 38 plus C in Siberia right now. This is off the charts. So I really advocate you all the next generation. We need you all to step up and continue these measurements because it's a changing world and it's changing faster than we ever expected. So. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely the time for international scholarship and collaboration mm -hmm. at this moment. Um, so our next question is gonna come from Tilden. We're gonna go ahead and unmute him to ask that question. Then you should be able to go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask. Hello. Hey, I know you. <laughs> oh. Are you there? Still muted there, Tilden. Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay. Hey, Dennis. Morning. I can't hear you now. Can anyway. You my, my question is, um, what, what do you see in terms of roles for UASs um, in terms of potentially applying some of the more like near IR methods for, let's say, examining spatial variability and getting spatial variability on photosynthesis and statistics over various land uses? And, and, and where do you see them potentially involving some providing some information on boundary layer turbulence and processes. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I guess I'm more excited about capabilities of these CubeSats using this uh, near infrared radiation from vegetation because they're on meter scale and they can do repeated measurements. Uh, and then we can scale that with um, photosynthesis. My, my problem always with airplanes is that's just kind of a one shot and you really still need, to, it's a moving tower. And to interpret it, you really need to have a flux footprint with remote sensing to really interpret what you're seeing. And I guess the questions I'm more interested in are more ecological and biogeochemical and often the airplane data or even the drones don't help answer that in terms of fluxes. Uh, I, I do see an important role for drones and aircraft with LIDAR. Um, you know, Boyd Hutchinson always wished to have this uh, 
skyhook and we have the skyhook now and so you can get really wonderful information about upwind structure and function with um, lidar to help interpret the fluxes but i guess i'm still a big fan of just a bunch of towers uh, and i think sticking them in there for a long term and getting the whole seasonality of them um, so um, there is interest in boundary layer, but again, we're working with other teams with boundary layer profile systems. Um, Manuel Helbig just wrote a nice white paper for Ameriflux on the pros and cons and needs of uh, atmospheric boundary layer measurements. Um, Noah has a nice profiler at Twitchell Island that we're using with Camilo Ray, my, my postdoc. Um, so I, I think we are getting some of that information and that, that helps us in understand PBL growth and trainment and positive and negative feedbacks on uh, evaporation CO2 rectifier effect. Okay. You saw your picture there, Tilden, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? <laughs> Tilden and I had interesting stories because when we were young, we were, we get bold and we would just run up and down the towers without safety belts. And one day Tilden almost slipped out of the tower and he says don't tell them my wife and i come home and i told my wife to show she was pissed at me <laughs> she says you guys must wear <laughs> safety belts forever and ever and ever and so we started doing that so <laughs> so luckily we're still alive and here to <laughs> reflect on these things the one time i was on the top of the walker branch tower at 44 meters and we had an infrared thermometer up there and i opened up the box and two flying squirrels jumped out at me i didn't have a safety belt and I went back, I looked, I didn't fall out of the tower myself. And these squirrels just flew in the air and just lit lightly on the forest and they were happy, but God, it scared the bejesus out of me. So this is why you have to be out in the field often too. Stuff happened, you know, ants get into data loggers, insects get into systems, um, critters eat cables. Um, so in some respects, it is important to have flux towers near where scientists are. And that's the hard part of really doing work at really, really remote sites. Going back to the first question this young person was asking about uh, the maps of FluxNet. Um, so. Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here really quick. It uh, looks like we had another question coming in. Um, let's see, uh, from Camilo, great presentation. Are there any parallels between the growth of eddy covariance measurements and the growth of large eddy simulations? for estimating surface fluxes. Have there been many comparisons between the two techniques? Well, there, there's been a few. Uh, Jordi Vila's group's really good at doing LES and working with uh, our group. Um, when I was actually a young scientist at Nebraska, um, we had a, a fellow named Dr. Chen. He was one of the first Chinese scientists to come to America after the Cultural Revolution. And he was really a pioneer in boundary layer meteorology. And I met him at one of the of uh, early uh, Asia Flux workshops in 2000, and he became a professor at Peking University. And he and his group were starting to develop LES models and compare um, with uh, flux systems to get a better sense of the footprints. And um, Saigusa, I forget her husband's name, he's also an LES modeler in Japan, and he'd written some early papers on that. There's a few papers. Um, we could use more, I think. Um, Monique Leclerc and I had a proposal many, many years ago to try to use LES modeling to look at footprints and then assess that across the, the network. Um, we had a postdoc and then he never finished and he left. So that kind of died. So kind of comes and goes, but I think that hasn't been finished up yet. There's still lots of roles. So I just found out that we actually have about 10 more questions that are uh, sitting on our list. Um, we did agree before we started the webinar that we'd be happy to continue for maybe an extra 10 minutes or 15 minutes, just because uh, we really think that discussion and dialogue is important. Um, so the next question is from Pramit. It was very nice to attend this great talk. We do not have many flux measurement sites in China and in India. Our group has started several CO2 and methane flux measurement stations. Do you have any advice for first generation flux researchers like us in India? Ah, oh, well. I went to one of the early Indoflux workshops, oh God, with Deb Agarwal in the early 2000s. And so there was a lot of planning and I was quite impressed with the technical skills that is available in India, especially in your ocean sciences. Uh, you have a lot of people working with remote sensing and buoys. So I think technically you have the, the skills, it's just a matter of, of building the uh, intellectual capital um, and getting people out there in the field to make the measurements and invest. Um, you know, right now we're sharing software, we're sharing uh, ideas to process things. So I think those aren't issues. 
the one scientist I did meet was interesting. He had a, a site in Northern India and he gave a nice presentation of this data. And then I asked him, what's the leaf area index? And he says, we didn't know what the leaf area index is. And I said, why? Well, they had man-eating tigers there. And so they had to mark their tower with a uh, fence to keep them from eat, getting eaten. So I, I can understand there's some technical challenges that are unique to India. Uh, so, um, but, you know, give me a remote sensing, I think you could help. So, but yeah, good luck. Please, please, we need more data from India. So if you can talk to powers to be, invest, uh, please keep going. I think Dr. Yeah. Jean, there's a few groups that do rice work that's quite nice. There's a, there's a few sites, but it could be more. Absolutely, don't give up. I know that one of the things the ECN network was talking about was creating a mentoring program. Mm -hmm. So we would be able to connect you with somebody who has more experience building the tower, um, a go-to person. Uh, our next question is, could you please talk a little bit about EC tower and non-flat terrains because there's lots of terrestrial ecosystems that are not always flat or ideal for EC measuring. Um, for EC measuring, got a super majority answering the demographics question. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, surface roughness, I believe, and, and not uh, where we're not having those flat. Yeah, I always go back to first principles. I mean, when I was always starting a new site, I always wanted to know about flux divergence. It's always hard to measure advection per se because the wind directions change. But you can put two flux towers at different heights. Tilden and I did that uh, at Oak Ridge. Uh, Mateo and I did that at Sherman Island. And so you can kind of prove to yourself whether you might be suffering from advection or not. Um, as you get to hillier or rolling terrain, the storage term is really important. So you need to measure concentrations uh, profiles. And we've done that in Oak Ridge and, and in, in, um, in Tonzi Ranch, for example. Um, our, our colleague in, in uh, Brazil found that to be really, uh, Orajo found that to be really important in Brazil. Uh, the tropical forest might look kind of flat from the sky, but if you walk into the forest, there's a lot of undulating uh, terrain. And that was causing a lot of the problems of missing CO2. And so he actually put CO2 concentration systems on his back and would walk through the forest and trying to understand the storage term. So uh, I think he's done one of the more uh, detailed analyses. And I just, you have to, again, go back to first principles and it's just not always eddy flux per se and understand that what's in the whys of this. Thank you. Uh, what do you think that we are doing okay that can be done better? Oh, sh sharing more data. <laughs> so there's a lot of groups out there that still haven't shared data. Um, that's, that's my big bugaboo. And despite all of our trying to do social interactions and having people come and get to know people, there's still people reluctant to share data. And that's my biggest frustration. And I don't think you gain much by not sharing data. You learn more about your own data by being able to look at data from other sites. Uh, no one steals anyone's data. Um, if anything, it, it adds to the scientific uh, infrastructure to do bigger and better things beyond what we can do at our individual sites. So uh, I really, I even got to the stage that even got mad at meetings a few times in the past. And so I've gotten over that now, but all I can say is work together. Um, it's, it's a win-win situation. Uh, can you kind of expand upon what are some of the steps that we should be taking before we're ready to share our data um, to ensure oh, good quality that's data? Fair. No, this is good. I mean, you definitely do want to do a lot of uh, QA, QC and plot your data, visualize your data. Um, you know, often young scientists ask me about certain things of processing their site. And I always say, just learn by doing. Um, I plot a lot of histograms, you know, and so don't just use blindly um, thresholds to cut off good and bad data. Look at your histogram for your site. Those are easy to do. Um, um, in the other days, like I said, we had a lot of spikes. And so, you know, Tilton and I were using kurtosis um, as a fourth uh, moment to try and find spikes to throw stuff out. So, you know, these are still useful. Um, and so you, know, you can calculate this. And, um, and also know your uh, flux detection limit. Um, you know, if you're trying again, going back to these other trace gases that might be small fluxes, you know, make sure your flux that you're measuring is um, significant above the noise of the sensor and the system essentially. Um, um, yeah, I think those are some of the ones. Nighttime's a little complicated, um, but then long-term averaging tends to 
um, sort of solve a lot of ills sometimes. So uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater either. <laughs> Those are, those are very good tips. Uh, another question just popped up and it says, thank you, professor. I once attended some workshops on EC measurements and the flux tower was 15 meters high in measuring CO2 concentration. What is your opinion on the terms of height of a measurement versus the fetch requirements? Oh, well, I mean, still the you know, 100 to one fetch to height is, is not bad. Um, you also wanna be able to reach the sensors and clean them and deal with them. So there's always these practical issues. Um, we do find going higher is a little bit better because then we're seeing bigger eddies and we maybe miss less flux. But again, I've been fortunate working here in California. I have huge fetches. Uh, my wetlands are often, you know, a kilometer to two kilometers. Um, so we've been using scaffold towers that, you know, Tilden and Martin Wesley um, pioneered. And I like that because then we can walk up to our sensors, we can bring them down, clean the sensors and put them back up. The other thing we do, I learned from Oak Ridge, is these booms for radiation. I see too many people trying to correct their energy balance and apply that to their fluxes. And I just think that's wrong. Um, you're trying to correct an eddy flux that's seeing a huge footprint that's often measuring the right co-spectrum with a ill sampled net radiometer has a small footprint that might be even seeing the tower and a few soil heat flux plates that are not well buried essentially. So I have a big argument on that one. If I have on my soapbox, I'll say, don't correct your evaporation fluxes for imbalance of the energy balance closure. Uh, Tilden more than anyone has known that if you measure all these fluxes really, really carefully and well, you can get good energy balance closure at good sites. So, and I've had the same experience, so. On the, on the same thread here, we had another question that says, you mentioned the importance of footprints and spatial heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, how well developed are the existing footprint models and is there any room for new insight or models? <laughs> uh, we're doing a lot of work on that ourselves, uh, just to test them, because there needs to be more work on it. Um, we had an ARM experiment back in 92, where I put a flex system on my pickup truck and I moved it up and down uh, on our, uh, potato field and uh, had an anchor flex tower and, we, and Gabby's group to actually use that to test their footprint model and it worked pretty well and that's why we partly we use that model and we've done a lot of work like that here in, in California. Uh, we put a flex system on pickup trucks and have moved it up and down. Camilo's doing some really nice work now releasing methane from our alfalfa field and testing a bunch of footprint models. So this is exactly the work we're, we're doing right now um, with Camila Ray, so it's exciting. So he's busy writing the PBL paper now, but that's one of the papers he'll follow up on, hint, hint. <laughs> that's a good little hint. Um, let's see, one more question here we got. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Dennis. What's your opinion about using eddy covariance flux data for national greenhouse gas inventory reports? Greetings from Argentina. Uh, I think they've, they've been underutilized. I mean, you, if you read the global carbon reports every year, um, there's really nothing from FluxNet. And I'd, I'd love to see them start taking our Flux integrated GPP maps that uh, Marcus Reichstein's group's developing with Martin Young and Young Bill Rue's also doing it with his best model. Um, you know, uh, that has not been used. And I've always felt the Flux community has been somewhat underutilized in the carbon cycle world for some reason. Um, so, I mean, granted we have small areas, but then, you know, I think we're doing a lot of work on how to upscale it. And so I think there's needs to be done more essentially. What do you think are some of the obstacles that are keeping the uh, carbon cycle community at large from recognizing the contributions of flux yeah, Maybe that's know. something we can work on together. Yeah, I mean, when, even when we had our first Flux workshop in the Tuil, uh, we invited a few to come to try and start the dialogue and they just didn't come. <laughs> so uh, yeah, just, they work at different scales and um, it's just taking time. I, I think we should still keep working at it. Um, so I think Europe's probably done a better job getting the two communities um, working together. Maybe it's just been competition uh, somewhat. States, um, states can be competitive, <laughs> that's probably part of it, so. Looks like we still got a couple more questions that we're gonna squeeze in here for you. Um, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take one that is from, uh, it says, hello, Baldoki, and many thanks for the presentations. Do you think that the drylands are so poorly presented, uh, represented in flux net measurements? And if no, 
Uh, what do you think should be done for a better representation? Well, I think drylands have been pretty well um, covered. Our colleagues in Australia are doing a great work. Um, also, Russ Scott and his, his team, I and mean, there's been a lot of nice papers coming out of, of the whole Southwest. Um, I think Gay Wolfhawk and others worked with some people in Nevada. And also our, our colleagues in Spain uh, actually seen um, emissions from, I guess, limestone from some of these dry areas. So there, there's a good amount of, of data coming. Uh, interesting questions. So fluxes could be small. Um, what I like about semi-arid systems, especially, you know, I'm kind of biased with my Mediterranean and California systems, is that they go from very wet to very dry. And we can do a really nice job looking at how whole ecosystems respond to rainfall and rainfall variability. And I've always been kind of a critic of rainfall manipulation studies because they tend to only have maybe one or two treatments and there's this limited area and you gotta think about the time of the rainfall and by mining huge data sets of rain interactions with whole ecosystem fluxes, we can watch this curvilinear response and figure out where the breakpoints are. Um, with rain additions and subtractions, either they're all very, very wet and a certain degree of that wetness, or they're all very, very dry. And so I think there's a lot of power um, for our semi-arid ecosystems that really tell us more about a future warmer and wetter and drier world, essentially. So and that's what, again, the paper I'm writing right now with our 20 years of Tonzi Lyra data. So, and learning a lot. Refining groundwater is a big, big, big role and how well these systems are able to have deep roots and tap groundwater. So a scale emergent property, and that's one I haven't talked about, but this is the fun, exciting thing about working with ecosystems at ecosystem scales is we're complex systems and scale emergent properties. So the snowpack in the Sierra Nevadas 50 kilometers away affect our groundwater that affect how well our ecosystems respond to drought. Who knew? All right, well, thank you for that response. I do have one last question to, to ask you. Um, it says, Ciao, Dennis, if you would have to decide in Ameriflux or Europe, would you go for more sites, lower quality, or less sites, higher quality? Oh, I've had that long discussion with uh, Detlef Schultz of many years. I was on the science uh, review panel for um, Carbo Europe. My answer was both, actually. Um, we need a bit of both. Um, we need really intense sites that study all the processes, the ecological processes, the respiration, the biogeochemistry. But then to do the upscaling, we need a lot of cheap sites. And we're trying to do both. And so I, I will still answer that as I think we need both. I don't think it's an either or question. And I think we need to think about the science and justify using both. Uh, I, I suppose that we will have a few more uh, questions that we won't be able to get to today. Uh, we're going to have to start wrapping it up. Um, I think that the discussion is really great. And Dennis, did I hear you say that you once posted something on Twitter? I, I do post on Twitter. But, 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 okay. But, I'm thinking that maybe some of these questions people can ask you over Twitter um, and get in communication with you at a future date as well. Sure, sure. Um, Patty Okawa was a postdoc in my lab, and she says, we're going to have a Twitter account. And I was very scared <laughs> on Twitter at the time. I got uh, 120 characters. I learned so much from it. I really try to keep it professional, and I, I find all these great papers from my colleagues. So I'm actually a big fan. I watch Twitter every day now. <laughs> okay, well, I encourage anybody that... Anybody that didn't get their question answered today, um, I'm a Twitter advocate myself, so... I would look for that or uh, go ahead and feel free to email any of us and we'll try and get your question answered. Uh, we will be, uh, this is recorded, so it's gonna be up online pretty soon. Um, it will be on YouTube. And if you have any accessibility concerns, feel free to get uh, a hold of us. But with that, I would like to thank you again, Dennis. Um, if there's anything else that you'd like to touch on before we sign off. I just wanna thank you all too and, and, and um, great questions. I really liked hearing from everybody. It's been a lot of fun and I hope, hope you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, um, feel free to, to write and contact if you have any other questions. Um, we share a lot of our papers and stuff online. So if you want anything for background and all my class notes are up online also. So if, if some of the younger students are interested in some of the theory, I taught, teach a course on 228 on advances in micromet and biomet at Berkeley that covers a lot of the eddy covariance stuff. And my undergraduate course on biomet is 129. And I'll be teaching that again this, this coming fall. And those notes are all up online also to share. So.
Thank you for that, Dennis. Uh, and just another announcement that we will be having a, a continuing our summer series as the Early Career Network. So in July, we're gonna try and discuss uh, some of the more techniques and methods used in flux measurements um, in replacement of the, the FluxNet course that we typically have for the summer. And then Ameriflux and FluxNet overall will be also organizing some additional events. So this was a great kickoff. Thank you everybody for showing up. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Lots of fun. Have a good day. Lots of fun. Hey, and stay safe. I'll make sure everyone stays safe. <laughs> <laughs> stay wear safe your, and healthy. Wear your masks. <laughs> all right. See you next month, everybody. Bye. Okay. Thank you.